Do you take a seat? Um, I had to check, double check myself before I came up this evening because um, I led a service over at Holdenhurst Road a few weeks ago. And luckily, just before I went up to uh, lead the service, I was informed that my um, shirt was tucked into my boxer shorts. So <laughs> thankfully, I was um, rescued there. And that, I, I just thought about that just now, and that's remarkably relevant to what I'm going to talk to you about tonight. <laughs> It'll make sense. You Christians are so judgmental. Don't you realize that Jesus said himself that you shouldn't judge others? I should really have done this before that, used the old uh, hand quote marks, because that was a quotation by a certain John Senior, i.e. me, 10 years ago. I said those words to my non-Christian friends. It was before I was a Christian. I wonder if any of you have heard such a phrase, uh, maybe personally, or in social media, or um, in the news, or wherever. In fact, they did a survey somewhere, I don't know how verifiable this is, but apparently 50% of non-Christians think that Christians are too judgmental. It's no surprise that this verse, uh, chapter 7, verse 1, don't judge, is one of the most famous verses from the whole Sermon on the Mount. Now, whether it's Instagram posts of, I've just eaten this donut and bacon combo, don't judge. I'm not quite sure that Jesus was thinking of this when he preached this sermon 2,000 years ago. Um, or more serious things, people pushing back on others judging their lives, uh, their lifestyle choices. Oh, yeah, we'll go on to that one in a sec. Um, but yeah, so people thinking, you know, I'll do what I want. I'll sleep with who I want. I'll buy what I want. You can't judge me. You shouldn't be challenging my lifestyle. But what does Jesus really mean? Does he mean that we should never challenge anyone's behavior? And is it a fair criticism of Christians that we're judgmental? Are Christians right to challenge each other or even those outside the church? And what's all this business to do with splinters, planks, dogs, and pigs? Well, hopefully I can show you tonight. Okay, so next slide. Now, I want you to imagine uh, that it's an alternate universe and dinosaurs still exist. Now, I've come to you and I've said, I've decided to buy a pet Tyrannosaurus Rex. I'm gonna keep him in the back garden, I'm gonna call him Ernie, um, and you know, it's gonna be pretty good. But you say to me, hey John, you know, what happens about your neighbors? He's probably gonna trample their fence. He might even eat them, which would be even worse. He'll be really noisy. The council will complain. Uh, and then, you know, how are you going to afford to buy all of that meat on your part-time B&Q job? Uh, I work part-time B&Q in this world. Um, and I, my response to you is, hey, don't judge me. Don't judge me, hey? I'll do what I want. You know, that would be a bit of a silly response when you were just trying to help me out. Now, whatever people say, no matter who they are, everyone in our world constantly makes moral evaluations of situations. Everyone, I would hope, rightly speaks up against injustice and abuse. Uh, can you imagine a world where someone was let off for murder because they said, hey man, don't judge me. And actually in today's passage, if you look at it, Jesus is apparently ignoring his own instructions to make moral evaluations because he calls people pigs and dogs, which isn't very complimentary, although I'll tell you about that later. So Jesus simply can't mean that we are not to evaluate one another. In fact, um, only God is the one who can truly judge fairly, and that will all make sense at the end of this little bit here. So what does judge mean? Uh, a few times in the New Testament, it does mean to evaluate a situation, to evaluate a person. But more often than not, it means to condemn. If we condemn someone, we write them off, we dismiss them. You see, even back in Jesus' day, there were judges, just like there are today. You see, judges, they'd know the accusation, they'd have all the evidence in front of them, they'd hear both sides, and they would either condemn the person, give them a sentence, or they would let them off. You would hope that a judge would give an impartial verdict, a fair verdict. I wonder how often me and you are impartial in our verdicts of other people. If we like someone and they do something bad to us, 
we're probably more forgiving than if we don't like that person, if we always have a, already have a preconception of that person. But how often do we really know both sides of the story? Maybe you don't think you've ever condemned anyone, and condemn isn't really a word we use in day-to-day -day speech anyway. But have you ever labeled someone? Ah, oh, that person's a gossip. They're a liar. They're a nasty piece of work. They're a horrible person, an idiot. Of course they do something like that because they're a total fill in the gap. Or maybe we witness something and, uh, from a Christian and we say, oh, you know, they can't be a Christian because they don't obey all of the Ten Commandments. I remember uh, myself making a snap decision about a Christian a few years ago in my previous church. I heard them swear. I heard them use a bit of choice language and I thought, oh, they can't be a Christian if they swear. That's, that's pretty bad. Um, and then I heard their story and I realized that they'd come from a place of real darkness where they'd been addicted to drugs. They'd been involved in crime, a real mess. And God had completely transformed their life in a huge way. And I looked at my own life and I thought, actually, they've been a lot more transformed than I have. At that, at that particular time. You see, God works in Christians in different ways at different paces. We can't apply our own uh, transformation on other people, you see. But still, God does improve and work through us and restore us. But these snap judgments, just like that one that went through my head, they often happen in our heads. You see, Jesus cares about what goes on in our heads. As we've seen throughout the Sermon on the Mount, what's going on in our heart, it matters. And in verse 2, Jesus says that we are condemned by the same measure that we condemn others. You see, if they're a liar, we call them a liar, then that makes us a liar too, because we've all lied at some point in our lives. Only when we lie, we make excuses for it. We say, well, you know, I had good reason to do that. I didn't want to upset that person. But when someone else does it, Ooh, oh, I can't believe they said that, that's awful. John Stott, who is a theologian, uh, died a few years ago, um, uh, just a couple of years ago, I think, and he said, the judgmental person is a fault finder who is negative and destructive towards other people. He enjoys, or they enjoy, actively seeking out their failings. They put the worst possible construction on their motives, pour cold water on their schemes, and is ungenerous towards their mistakes. You see, only God can pass sentence on anyone. And that's this bit here. Only God can judge fairly. When we dismiss others, when we condemn others, we are putting ourselves where God is. We're putting ourselves in his seat. So we need to challenge ourselves. Are we someone who has a fault-finding mentality in other people? Okay, so maybe, maybe that's not you. Um, in reality, I would say that we all do that to some degree. As we'll see, we're not very good at evaluating ourselves very well. So even if uh, condemning, you maybe don't think, I'm not a judgmental person. There is actually another extreme, an opposite extreme, which is also very unhealthy. See, if you look at Jesus' words, he doesn't just say, don't judge others and you know, just leave it at that. He doesn't say, don't judge others and just go about your life and just mind your own business. These two extremes are two extremes that Christians generally fall one or the other side of. On the top left, you have your prideful, judgmental person. But then on the bottom right, you have your peace man, peace and love, which is basically moral indifference. Doesn't really matter what you do, as long as you don't hurt anyone, just go and behave however you want. It's nobody else's business how I live my life. But whatever we hear from the world, neither of these positions are really loving. You see, as Christians, we are expected to challenge one another, to challenge our brothers and sisters when we see them acting in a way that isn't in line with God's plan for us, that isn't in line with the gospel. That's exactly what Jesus expects us to do. In verse 3, Jesus talks of that splinter or that speck of sawdust, that tiny little thing in other people's eyes that he assumes at some point we will try and help that person deal with. This splinter is important. If you think about it, if you got a splinter in your eye, you would struggle to see properly. Your eye would probably be watering and bloodshot, and it would be pretty nasty. You see, in Jesus' day, they didn't really have mirrors, as good mirrors as today. They were a bit blurry. They still had them. But really, you need someone else to point out to you that you've got a splinter in your eye, um, or at least help you get it out of your eye. It's a bit like... Um, whenever you get food in your teeth. Now, my wife Lucy's very good at spotting food in my teeth. 
It always seems to be like a big green bit on, on the front of my teeth, and it always takes ages to get out. It's always really annoying. Well, a splint is even worse than that. It takes time, and it's a difficult process, but it must be dealt with. You can't walk around with a splinter in your eye. But actually, if you think a splinter is bad for your eyesight, try having a massive big plank in your eye, which is what Jesus talks about in verse 3, 4, and 5. Now, this plank or log um, is meant by Jesus to be ludicrous and ridiculously hilarious. People would have fallen about laughing uh, back in the day. Uh, they obviously had different culture, a different kind of humor, but, but you know, it, it would have been relevant for them and they would have found it funny. But here Jesus is using hyperbole, which is one of those really stupid posh words for exaggeration. Um, if you want to impress someone who likes Shakespeare, talk to them about hyperbole. They'll absolutely love it. Um, but yeah, so this plank, it would have been used in building work, and it would have been huge. Probably the gap between here and here it would have been uh, used to build a house. It would have been part of the, uh, the building, uh, you know, the kind of the beam that you would put across the house. Um, so just think about that. This person walking around with a huge telephone pole, walking, uh, you know, walking around, sticking out their eye, bashing people over the head, um, you know, uh, you, know, you wouldn't be allowed anywhere, you wouldn't be allowed in a concert and that kind of thing. It'd be a bit of a nightmare. But most importantly, the thing to remember here is that you wouldn't be able to see anything. If you think a little splinter, that might affect your eyesight a little bit. But a plank, a big plank, you're just going to be completely blind. So you can understand why Jesus says, if you can't see anything, you're not really in a position to be challenging someone else for their splinter in their eye. And that's why he, he challenges us to deal with that plank. It is interesting, though, how Jesus, Jesus assumes in verse 3 to 5 that we have a plank in our eye. He doesn't say, oh, you might have a plank in your eye, and, you know, but if you do, deal with it. He says, first, deal with the plank in your eye. And it's important to notice here, you might think that, well, if I'm criticizing, if I'm challenging someone for gossip, I need to be a gossip as well. No, that's not what Jesus is saying here. It doesn't need to be the same kind of struggle, but it's something that we must deal with. And it's something that he assumes. You see, it's fair to say that if Jesus assumes that we're blind to our own plank, that he's probably saying that we rationalize the things that we do wrong. When we do wrong, we rationalize it. And we also try and focus on other people. Oh, they do something even worse than me, whatever that is. Stephen Covey, who's this sort of a motivational American dude, um, he says, we judge ourselves by our intentions and we judge others by their behavior judge ourselves by our intentions. Oh, well, I did that because I had to, and other people by their behavior. We take one aspect of someone else, and they do this tiny thing, and we tar their whole personality, their whole character, on the basis of that one thing that they did, that one thing that they um, hurt us or someone else with. Perhaps we hear a sermon and we think, oh, you know, so-and-so would love to hear this sermon. This would be exactly right for that person. But I mean, isn't it crazy how, although we all know ourselves so well, we know ourselves a thousand times better than anyone else, and yet we're not able to see our own faults. Isn't that crazy? Many years ago, uh, I broke up with a girl just after I'd finished uni, and, and I was very hurt by what happened. It re really hurt me. Um, she said some un unkind things, and I shared it with my friends, and my friends said, oh, yeah, she was... She sounded pretty horrible. She was a bit of a, uh, you know, a bit of a psycho, a bit of a nutter. And I was like, yeah, you're right, you know. And I completely agreed with them. And, and for years afterwards, I'd tell this story about this girl and go, oh, she was a nutter. She did this thing, and she did this thing, she did this thing. Um, you know, speaking really badly of, of how she behaved. And then I became a Christian. Um, and when I became a Christian, it didn't change uh, straight away. I carried on telling the same story, you know, going through the line. People found it quite entertaining, um, you know, and it was... Uh, uh, and that was, you know, seemed to be, it didn't, nothing seemed to change. But then God started slowly opening my eyes. As I looked back on that relationship, I suddenly realized, actually, I'd not acted very well either. I'd been hurtful. I'd said hurtful things. I'd not been loving in the way that I could have been. And I realized I had this huge plank in my eye that had stopped me seeing things properly in that relationship. And as God healed that hurt, my own view of that, of what happened, changed. And my bitterness started to disappear. And I realized that I was full of fault myself. You see, becoming a Christian is a bit like moving into a new house. Uh, we've just moved into a new house recently. I don't know if you can identify with this. You first see the house and you go, oh, it looks really nice. You know, we don't really need to do much. And then you move in and you're like, 
I don't remember that hole in the wall over there. And I don't remember that scratch on the floor. And Lucy, did you put that big mark on the wall? And it's just, you know, there's a million things you need to sort out that you weren't aware of when you first saw it. It's a bit like that when you become a Christian. You think, yeah, I'm okay, maybe one or two things I need to deal with. But God shows you that there's lots and lots in your life that you need to deal with. And he shows that bit by bit. There's lots of planks and bits of dirt and scratches in your life that you need to sort out. But we, with God's help and also the help of others, we deal with those planks in our eye. And as we do that, we're humbled. It brings us down and it radically affects our view on others and other people that have hurt hurt us. I wonder if there's anyone tonight in our, uh, perhaps people in our life that have hurt us, maybe recently or maybe an old hurt that still lingers that we feel bitterness towards. Let God help you see that person uh, as someone, yes, they hurt you, but you also have your own struggles, your own plank. And when you do that, that bitterness will start to disappear because you don't look at them, oh, they did that horrible thing to me, I'm up here, but actually you realize you're on the same level as them and your bitterness will start to dissipate. If you look at verse five, Jesus uses the word hypocrite. Now this word is important, he uses it quite a few times in the Sermon on the Mount. Um, And in chapter, chapter six, as well as this chapter, Jesus presents two different approaches to the same actions. Two people doing exactly the same thing. In chapter six, which has probably um, been preached on over the last few weeks, two people are both giving to the poor, they're fasting, and they're um, praying. They're both doing the same thing. On the surface, they both look identical, but one does it to show off, and the other one does it in secret, um, with humility. Underneath, they're totally different, and it's the same with today's passage. If you look um, at these two different people which, you, uh, which are presented, the first verse is the condemning and prideful person who's judging others and their struggles, whereas the person in verse five who you'd hope looks at plank in their eye first, they do with the opposite intentions, with love, realizing that they themselves are full of struggle and full of sin, and as they work through that, they're able to approach that other person with humility. That first person refuses to accept criticism, distances themselves from the person they condemn, and they feel superior to them, looking down on them, and actually making that person feel worse. Meanwhile, that second person, they humbly deflect attention away from themselves, and they're longing to connect with that person, and they're willing to be challenged, and they're also willing to challenge others gently. They build that bridge of compassion with that person because they love them genuinely. Can you imagine for us Christians if we were to all walk around and see planks in our own eye and specks in other people's eyes? What a radical community that would be. Remember, before you criticize someone or think about someone badly, remember your plank. Remember, you've got a whole pile of planks that you need to deal with in your life. All of us do. And we should be happy to talk about our faults with our Christian brothers and sisters. I know it's particularly hard. Some days it's hard to look in a real mirror, never mind a metaphorical heart mirror um, with a friend or a member of your family. But notice in verse 3 how Jesus says, brother or sister. It's someone close. He also says later on in chapter 18 uh, that when we challenge someone, it is someone close. It's done gently in privacy, we don't do it publicly, we don't involve other people in that conversation in any way. And actually, if you look at the Apostle Paul, who writes in a letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 5, he says that we are not to judge those outside the church. That is not our job. We are to gently challenge one another within the church. So yes, we are right to stand by what God teaches us, but not to be going around criticizing non-Christians. Oh, you shouldn't be doing that, you shouldn't be doing that. But as Christians, more is expected of us. We have a higher standard that God expects us to follow. And we need our Christian brothers and sisters to point out those things that we cannot see ourselves. Um, It's really challenging. I got married um, last year and it was very challenging. Obviously it's great, but it was also very challenging in that um, when I got married to Lucy, I realized there was all this stuff wrong with me that I needed to sort out that was completely fine when I was on my own. Um, But actually, um, you know, uh, Lucy was like, oh, you know, there's this stuff which kind of annoys me. And um, uh, and actually it was painful, but it's necessary. And we need to do that with our Christian brothers and sisters too. So maybe this week, Um, Go to that person close to you. You need to have someone close to you 
a Christian brother or sister and say, can you tell me uh, about the stuff in my life which isn't so great? Maybe just one thing. Don't kind of ask for a whole list of stuff. It might be a bit overwhelming. Uh, But, you know, recognizing that issue that you have is half of the battle as a Christian. But what about verse 6 concerning dogs, pigs, and pearls? Well, it almost seems unconnected to the previous verses, but I promise it isn't. Now, you, if you are my wife, Lucy, uh, when you, well, uh, and probably lots of other people, if you think of dogs and pigs, you probably think of these two. Oh, aren't they cute? Oh, aren't they really cuddly? Now, I want you to banish that from your mind completely. Banish that from your mind, because these cute, cuddly images are not what they would have looked like in the time of Jesus. And this is not what Jesus was referring to. They would have looked more like this, those two. Uh, Dogs were not cuddly. They didn't appreciate being patted on the head. And probably, if you tried to feed a dog, it would growl. It'd be like, leave me alone. They'd be really angry. In fact, dogs would hang around at the dump, um, and they were pretty filthy, happy to eat anything. They'd even eat human flesh if they chanced upon it. So they were like zombie dogs. Um, And pigs, they didn't have much better press. Pigs were pretty dirty as well, filthy. They'd eat any old junk. But Jesus says in verse 6, you shouldn't feed pearls to pigs. You see, if you offer a pearl a pig, it's not going to understand the value of it. A bit like if you were to get an iPhone 7, show it to your dog and go, look at this iPhone 7. It's got a new uh, camera, got amazing battery life. It's got the new operating system. The dog's just going to just shrug. A bit like this Chinese kid who bought his dog eight of the latest iPhones. It's a true story, look it up. He bought eight iPhones. And you can see that dog, look at him. He looks so sad. He's, he's longingly thinking about his dinner. He, he doesn't care about his iPhones. He doesn't see the value in those iPhones. And that's the same thing here, you see. That if you uh, offer a pig or a dog a pearl, they're just not going to appreciate the value. But also, if you offer a pig or a dog a pearl, it's likely to choke. It's likely to choke. It's not going to be very nice. It might like... Uh, choke on it. And if they're a particularly grumpy pig, they might even turn around and attack you and kill you, which would be really not very good. So what is this about? Well, this is the same with sharing our faith with others. Talking about Jesus with our friends, whoever they are, all of our non-Christian friends. You see, for us, it's the most valuable and life-changing thing for us. It's like a pearl, really, really valuable. And yet often people will seem just not interested. They might turn around and say, well, that's nice for you. You know, let's just change the conversation and talk about something else. Jesus is saying that there comes a time when you need to stop badgering people about your faith. For certain people that are obviously getting annoyed and reacting aggressively. We shouldn't just keep going on about it because actually it can do more harm than good. We are, of course, as Christians, called to share our faith with everyone. That's, That's a given. And... Uh, But we still need to be wise about knowing when to shut up. And it can be disheartening if people don't seem to care. But remember that we don't know what's going on in that person's life. Often we only see a small percentage of that person's life. So don't be too disheartened. We don't know how God is going to work in that person's life in the future. But remember, these verses are not a judgment on those pigs and dogs. Oh, those non-Christians are pig and dogs. That is not at all what Jesus is meaning. Remember, the plank, we have a plank in our own eye. All of these verses are like a boomerang. You throw this boomerang, and it's like, oh, I'm going to judge you, and it comes back to you. You throw this boomerang of um, seeing that speck in the, your brother or sister's eye, and then it, come back to, it comes back to hit you with that huge plank in your own eye. And it's the same here. The issue here is for us to be gentle and sensitive when we share our faith. We share it with humility. We go go in there pridefully going, bashing them over the head. You must listen to what I'm saying. I've got the best idea here. And we're not judgmental of our non-Christian friends. But also, remember that it's valuable to us. And because it's valuable, we don't kind of misuse it when we share it with others. So how do we do all of this stuff? People outside the church over the years have quoted... um, Uh, Well, they've talked about the Sermon on the Mount, which are all this big sermon by Jesus, and they've said, it's an awe-inspiring piece of teaching. It's a very beautiful, peaceful set of rules to live by. But 20th century author C.S. Lewis, 
He said, that is nonsense, rubbish. He saw it completely differently. He described it as a sledgehammer smashing you over the head and knocking you on your face because it's so difficult. He, described, he says that it makes impossible and terrifying demands of us, all of this sermon. Even in the verses today, how can we possibly never ever judge anyone in our, in our mind, never ever make those snap judgments or constantly see planks in our own eyes before dealing with everyone else in that situation? It's very difficult. How can we read these demands in the Sermon on the Mount and not flinch with fear? I want to tell you a story uh, about a man called James. He's a church minister. Um, seemingly sorted life. He's got two kids, uh, very happy in his church. Everything seems to be going well. Then one cold February night, James gets a call from the police station. It was about his son who'd been caught smoking cannabis. As the story unravels, James discovers that his son has got a life engulfed in drugs. It has completely ruined his life. To help deal with this issue and rebuild the relationship with their son, James and his wife start going to parenting workshops. At the first gathering, James found himself full of judgmental thoughts. These people are terrible. They must be horrible parents. All their kids are drug addicts. During one of the times of sharing, one of the mothers at the workshop shared about her son, who had just tried to quit a gang. James noticed she was wearing a ring with a small pentagram on it, which is a satanic symbol. At this moment, two thoughts went through James' head. The first sarcastically announced, well, no wonder your son is so screwed up, lady. What do you expect? You're a satanic witch. But another thought went through James' head, softer, but no less clear. So, James, what are you doing here? It was a painful moment for James. He replayed all those previous judgmental statements that had been resounding in his head, and he was embarrassed. He wanted to run away. That night, the first line he wrote down in his journal was, James, you're a self-righteous fool. He continued to ponder in his mind about this lady's witchcraft, and how can a rational, intelligent woman get involved in witchcraft? How can they choose this path? And he realized that it probably gave her a sense of power and control. It was a type of idolatry, of worshiping something. James then turned to himself. How can a rational, intelligent Christian man like me be so judgmental? It must be because I also want a sense of power and control. My judgmentalism is also idolatry. It's worshipping myself instead of God. It's sin. My sin is so bad that it needs a cross. And that is exactly what I have. The next day, James went to the uh, sat next to the witch during the morning session. He was glad to see her. They talked about their sons, how they were concerned for them, and how they couldn't wait to see them again. James has thought about this lady and her son ever since then and has prayed for them many, many times. That experience changed James. It broke him. He realized the power of grace. He saw that if he was going to have any connection with God at all, he needed forgiveness for those things, far worse than smoking or drinking or swearing. He needed forgiveness for anger, for bitterness, for hatred, for self-righteousness, for all those ugly attitudes and actions. But he knew that Christianity offered this kind of forgiveness, that God alone could forgive him and restore him. Now, for us tonight, that forgiveness is available to all of us. Why is that? Because the one who is perfect, Jesus Christ, he had nails smashed into his hands and feet by a sledgehammer, just like that one. He was hung on a plank, on a cross, so that he could take all that judgment, all that punishment that me and you deserve. This is Jesus who was and is the perfect judge, the one who deserved no punishment, who, when he was on earth, he didn't have harsh condemning words for those really sinful, awful tax collectors and prostitutes and thieves. He had the harshest words for those prideful religious types, those goody two-shoes. In Psalm 22, which was written hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus uh, lived on earth, it was a prophetic, a prophetic psalm 
that predicts the suffering that Jesus will go through. And actually, he cries out the first verse, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me on the cross? In this verse, we read in verse 16, um, and this talks about the suffering that Jesus was going to go through. It talks of dogs encircling him. These dogs, and that's, that's me and you, that's human beings, are the ones that pierce his hands and his feet. 